<laughs> and since we've been travelling around the world doing our lockdown specials all the way around the world, mm. we found out in America that um, it's now an essential item. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh. I mean, that's going around so, where, where they're saying <clears throat> it's so, illegal to get a haircut, but you can still have, but it's legal to have weed well, if and you got that right. <laughs> it's profound. I think one on that one. It's profound. It's not written into law, but there's no way they can go back to saying it's anything other than an essential item. Yeah. And um, I'm oh. delighted to have our next guest on the show piped in from Northern California. He's about 100 kilometers north, 100 miles north of San Francisco up the coast. Yeah. And his name's Martin A. Lee. And Myrtle and I met him in um, Europe at a conference a couple of years ago. And he completely captivated us with a, uh, a presentation about CBD and LSD, the miracle molecules. And that's like, that's the man. He's talking about, he's he's talking about things. So this. He's actually the founder of um, uh, C uh, Project CBD in America. Okay. And... Uh, He's the kind of go-to man at the moment, I think, for anything to do with uh, the C-word and um, cannabis, because everybody's like this hero about what we can do with viruses, have you noticed? Mm. Martin, are you there? Is Martin Lee in the house? Yes, I am. Very, very happy to be with you. Good to see you again. Okay, there you are, man. Great to see your face. Fantastic. Thank you for... Um, Trying twice. We tried last week. We didn't get it together, but now uh, I'm so glad to be talking to you in Northern California, and that's the power of technology. Um, we, I presume, you've been in some sort of lockdown state for a while, Martin. Yes, in California we have. Um, it's important that we do this, obviously. Um, but in, in California, particularly with respect to the, the cannabis community, the cannabis industry, as we now call it, you, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is, is now just the latest of a series of calamities that we've experienced. You recall that in California, we now have these terrible fires every, sea, every uh, end of summer, early fall. This is now happening several years in a row. And it, uh, definitely affects uh, the cannabis community in Northern California. You know, it has traditionally been the cannabis breadbasket uh, for North America, and, uh, the, the so-called uh, Emerald Triangle region of Northern California and Southern Oregon. Uh, so, you know, we had to deal with that this summer. Um, then there was the vaping crisis, uh, another calamity, and now this, you know, it's one thing after another. Uh, but if there's uh, one thing I could say about the cannabis community, it's very resilient. It's had to be, it's had to learn resilient skills because for so many years we've had to operate totally underground. And that's no longer the case in California because um, it's now legal uh, to uh, possess cannabis if you are 21 years or older. You can walk into uh, many stores around the state and just walk in and buy cannabis. That it's, uh, you know, we often complain about California, how the legalization has been difficult in many ways. And it it's, uh, uh, has a lot of problems the way it's been implemented. But, you know, when I talk to my friends in other countries about this, they look at me like saying, oh, yeah, you have such problems. We still been you know, everyone's being thrown in jail all the time in, in London and you know, that kind of thing. It, 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 it's much tougher in other places. Nonetheless, even legalization has been one of those earthquakes that have really shaken the community in, in, in California that we haven't still fully reconciled it and, and integrated that in, in a balanced way into our life. But yet it is true, you mentioned, it is now considered an essential industry, providing an essential service in California and several other states. And that just underscores the, the tremendous contradiction that something could be essential yet federally illegal. You know, with respect to CBD in particular, it is now descheduled entirely uh, by the DEA if it is a pharmaceutical pill. Uh, but it's a Schedule One, meaning that the most strict schedule, the most extreme form of illegality, if it's any other form, a non-pharmaceutical form. So again, highlighting the contradiction, you know, one molecule being the worst and the best possible, you know. And, and I think we're still in this transition now in, in, in California and elsewhere. We're, we're in betwixt and between. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the pandemic that we're experiencing now really you know, just forces the issue in a lot of ways. We're going to have yeah. to ultimately decide because 
things are so extreme and bad, you know, with the budget and all that, we have to ask ourselves, well, you know, maybe legalizing cannabis fully, not just in certain states for certain things, uh, will be a great benefit in terms of an economic recovery and a social recovery in dealing with this pandemic. Well, well, since we saw you in Prague in 2018, we've had a decriminalization, a de facto blanket decriminalization of the personal use of the plant. We can cultivate it nationwide and we can use its products and we can smoke it in the privacy of our own homes. So that's quite a profound thing. And coupled with that during our lockdown, the government deemed it necessary to ban alcohol and cigarettes. The day we locked down, they banned alcohol and tobacco, which sent people screaming up the walls. And because of that, weed is kind of having a renaissance in South <laughs> Africa because it's the easiest thing in the world to get at the moment, really. It really is. <laughs> so there, there's many it's sort of... Wrong, in a way. There's, some, there's some funny silver linings going on, but, you know, um, my feed is full of pseudo-epidemiologists and virologists and everybody's a superhero with all the plethora of information we've got now. So I figured I'd go to Project CBD to ask, you know, the, man, the dude at the top, if there was any link whatsoever that we know of, good or bad, that we could, with there any knowledge that we've got to help us along our way with this epidemic, the, the pandemic that's going on? Is there any hope that, calif that uh, the, the cannabis will be the silver bullet and we can say, we told you so? You know, it's, 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 not, it's not inconceivable, let's put it that way. I, I, I try to uh, err on the side of caution with these things. And cannabis is, is such a positive uh, uh, in terms of health benefits, it, it, CBD in particular, but certainly not exclusively, THC is right up there with it. Um, but we've seen, you know, that, that in some cases, mir really miraculous outcomes. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but sometimes people with very serious illness can be literally uh, snatched from the jaws of death thanks to cannabis. Uh, so, you know, given that, I don't think we need to overstate what it can do because it's pretty amazing. Uh, so we don't need to make claims without really a basis for it. But you know, when it comes to, whenever you're dealing with it's an inflammatory condition, um, cannabis can potentially help because cannabis is anti-inflammatory. Scientists understand, you know, what is going on in the brain and the body when uh, one uh, consumes uh, THC rich or CBD rich or a mixture of both uh, th that kind of cannabis product. Uh, definitely has an anti-inflammatory impact. Uh, but you know, when you're dealing with something like this virus, it's complicated because uh, you know, an anti-inflammatory um, uh, response you know, suggests that something will be suppressing immune function, and the, it, it, immunity and inflammation go together in that sense. You, you know, inflammation is not inherently a bad thing, uh, but you know, with cannabis, with CBD and THC, both they do have, uh, at least from one perspective, an, an um, immunosuppressive quality. They're anti-inflammatory. And that's the reason why cannabis is such an excellent choice for dealing with uh, autoimmune diseases, of which there are, you know, there are hundreds of different kinds of autoimmune diseases. Um, but if you're in a situation where you want to strengthen your immunity to resist infection from a virus or to, uh, uh, if you are exposed, to, to, to keep, it, keep the effects at a minimum, in theory, it may be... Um, Problematic if one is is consuming something that is going to slightly suppress your immune response. Right. Uh, if you need a strong immune response to resist something, um, you know. But that's merely in theory because we don't see in reality people who are consuming cannabis any more exposed or vulnerable to the virus. Um, so we have to sort of separate the theories from the, the from the realities here. Um, so, you know, is, is it a problem if one is taking cannabis and, and, and wants to resist the virus? It doesn't seem to be the case, even though it sort of contradicts uh, the theory. Uh, but that's, the, that's often the case with cannabis, incidentally, that, that the reality doesn't go along with, with the theory. Um, look, look at in terms of um, just the, the idea of obesity. The fact of the matter is when you compare, just as a digression, when you compare a, a group of people who are cannabis users to a similar number who are not cannabis users, generally, cannabis users have slimmer waistlines, uh, have less incidence of obesity and metabolic disorder. 
Well, in theory, when you, you, when you consume cannabis, particularly THC-rich cannabis, it gives you the munchies, and you would think that that would be anything that it, it kind of induce obesity or, or, or lay the groundwork for it. So the theory and the realities don't always match. But to come back to the virus, you know, the virus has many phases. Some people are exposed, don't show any symptoms. Some people show mild symptoms. Some people show symptoms severe enough to warrant hospitalization, and some ultimately could die from it. We see that because of something called a cytokine storm, a, a yes. uh, kind of an immune response gone haywire. Now, here you have a situation, that extreme situation, where if, if you have a, an overactive immune response, really to the nth degree, you know, exponentially active, um, maybe in that situation, uh, a, a, um, a remedy can be developed based on cannabis because it is a very strong immune modulator. That maybe the research will develop something that cannabis indeed could be, or something in cannabis maybe, uh, maybe maybe CBD, maybe THC, or a combination thereof, uh, could be, could be something that would be very appropriate in this situation. And indeed, there are there is some research going on now in Israel and Canada, you know, toward that effect. Uh, you, you can't say for sure, but I would think, given what we know in theory, um, one would be remiss not to pursue this kind of research. Right. Uh, there's a real possibility here because uh, cannabis is an extraordinary anti-inflammatory uh, herb. Isn't there, isn't there a big thing going on with the DEA in the next couple of weeks? There's something going into the Senate about how they're going to open up research on the plant for just about every reason, because it's, it, you know, it's so locked down federally. I think they're just about to lighten the load about such research, aren't they? I would like to think so. I would hope so. That would suggest maybe that you know saner minds would prevail in this situation. But it's been such a long haul with the DEA, yeah. you know, getting them to move off this position where they've been blocking research. Um, heard it over and over again you know, since the Obama oh now the DEA is going to change and they're going to allow other sources for cannabis uh, to be available to scientists because right now the, the problem is. The federal government controls scientific access to the flower, to the actual plant material. And it can only be sourced from one particular place, and that's the uh, University of Michigan, excuse me, Mississippi, has a sort of a cannabis farm in which they grow it for experimental purposes and then provide it to the government uh, to be allocated in those very rare situations that scientists are actually allowed to access it. So you have this Again, this crazy contradiction where uh, anybody in California can walk into a store and buy cannabis if you're 21 or older, uh, or you can get it on the street without going through there. I mean, it, really anybody day and change, you know, the leopard changing its spots. I, I, I would hope so. That would be a, a rational thing to do. It would be um, uh, really, I would say, near criminal to, to continue the policy of, of um, blocking access to, a, to an herb that has obviously so much medical potential. We'll see how it plays out. <laughs>